All right, we are recording. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Sustainable Design Masterclass. We're so excited to have you guys join us yet again. It's a bit earlier than we normally go, but that's all the better to start your day with some inspiration. Um, so Sustainable Design Masterclass, we gather some of the top regenerative, regenerative designers, entrepreneurs, activists, ecosystem regeneration practitioners in the world, and we bring them on you to showcase some things that are inspiring, that are actionable, that people have been doing for their, you know, the last 10 years, and, and just to show you, just to showcase what is possible, what is possible, what we can do with the world, even with when it's degraded, even when things look dark, we can turn it around if we work together and we hold our vision. So before we get started, I want to tell you guys to turn off your distractions, cell phones off, Facebook off, Instagram. I know some of you guys have it open. I see your Instagrams. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slap you on Instagram if you keep it open. So turn that off and any other derpy things like Snapchat. So you want to be present because Rebecca is going to be fantastic today. So uh, once again, I'm Raleigh Latham, uh, joined by Neil Spackman. We're co-founders of Sustainable Design Masterclass. So why don't we get this show on the road? Neil, why don't you intro Rebecca? Let's do it. All right, everybody, welcome back. For those of you who are return visitors, for those of you where this is your first time, we're glad to have you. Um, Rebecca, I, you and I have had a couple near hits. I was supposed to come to a talk you were giving a few years ago, and then the schedule got flipped around, and I missed you. But you've been on my radar ever since. Uh, I think it's it's like three years now, and I'm I've never gone into the details, but generally on uh, we're talking about food and ecosystems here, but there's this entire industry of textiles and fibers that is also uh, crucial in how we interact with the land, how we interact with ecosystems, how we interact with, and, and it's it's a major aspect of agriculture that we typically don't talk about very much at least on this uh, on this program. And so I'm really excited that we got you on today um, because I think you're one of the people that's really pushing this in the right direction. Um, and you've been a really big leader on this for a lot of people coming out of the community that I come from, um, which is the permaculture slash regenerative agriculture kind of, kind of community. And so, um, Really glad to have you on. Thankful that we could get you for the time you've got, and uh, take it away. This is this is your show now. Thank you, Neil. I very much appreciate you spending the time organizing this, and I would just say you are your community and or our community actually is not alone in in generally leaving fiber systems out of the agricultural and ecological restoration conversation. It's, um, <clears throat> it's actually something that we don't really think about um, because we've been told that clothing is really about creating an image, you know, and how to, how to consume certain textiles that will tell the rest of the people around you your status or, you know, like that, that you, you've accomplished these things in your life because you can wear these clothes. You know, that's what mainstream consumer society is generally pumping down. Um, the culture's throat. And so we just don't often think about where these things are coming from. We think about the superficial nature of their color or their pattern, their texture. And that's not to say the folks on this webinar are coming from that place, but that's what we're indoctrinated to, to view textiles from that vantage point of surface design and what it means for our image. So Fibershed is looking at that the kind of the opposite approach. We're going from the soil upward. How do these textiles get grown? How are they grown? How are the dyes grown? How can we metabolize those fibers and dyes in a community and create meaningful livelihoods for people? And then also be wearing clothing that can return to the soil from which it came. So we call this system soil to soil. And there's very little conversation really about <laughs> high-end fashion up to this point, but I, I do think fashion will play a role in this movement because they're, they're pretty much game-changing marketers and we do need them, but 
we really want to revamp the, um, the baseline systems for how we're creating clothing through this movement. And the fiber shed system, I mean, just it's, it's based off of an analogous food shed or a watershed concept. <clears throat> what is the strategic geography that clothes you? So where is that land and who is on that land and what are they doing? to create the things that you need to create your first form of shelter. So you have how we construct our homes, where we're living. We always think of that as a, as a shelter, but really a textile is your first form of shelter. And in my community, even though I'm in a temperate, um, historically it was a temperate rainforest, we've dried it out a bit. It's, it's um, less a rainforest now, but it is still a temperate Mediterranean climate nine months of the year I wouldn't survive outside even two nights without something covering my skin. So as integral as water and food is to my survival, so is my a covering on my skin, some sort of covering. Um, so I think of the textile system as integral to survival um, and that's why fiber sheds to me are so important is we need to understand what fiber and dyes, what that means for our health and well-being and having access to land that can produce our fiber is also integral, I think, to our survival. And making beautiful cultures as well. It's not just about survival, it's about beauty. So um, just to frame what the work that we often, we kind of overlook sometimes is that um, the, the arts, the, the art that comes out of these farming systems. Once you grow the raw material, it's important to remember that these simple practices of knotting, um, knotting fiber together or weaving fiber together, that as we engage in these arts, we are creating something that is tied to historic traditions that go back really to the Neolithic period. And that we're making these things um, is not only for our bodies, but there's very much something soulful and cellularly charged about this work. Um, so it is, it is the work of our ancestors. And just to refrain on the problem statement, I'll go through this briefly because I know this is a proactive group who wants to focus on the solutions. But we do have a, a challenge when we are purchasing clothing from mainstream sources, from kind of the larger global industrial models. 80% of the workers in the industry are women, but the top 15 grossing international um, fast fashion brands, um, none of these companies have female CEOs. There's a lot of inequity in the system that goes down to the milling. Here's, you know, GMO cotton being milled in Bangladesh. And we really only have 1% guarantee on all the clothing made globally in this trillion, multiple trillion dollar industry. Only 1% of the garments are considered fair trade which means we're giving people a wage that's commensurate with a living wage for their culture and community. Um, and we don't really have verification that this is happening on 99% of the clothes that are purchased. And so really it comes down to this. Um, there's a lack of, there's, there's an anonymity in the supply chain. Um, we don't really know who, what, where, and why. We know why, we're consuming it, we wanna consume it. But for the consumer, it is virtually impossible to know whether a product was manufactured in safe conditions. And this is the Rana Plaza factory where a, a sewing factory collapsed and killed 1,100 people in Bangladesh. <clears throat> I believe this was in 2013. The other thing we have to just consider in our clothing is bringing a consciousness to the acrylics and the polyesters and the nylons that we consume <clears throat> and how our rapid fire consumption process, which is really hit in around 2002 when some of these fast fashion brands hit the scene, global consumption of plastic clothing skyrocketed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when we think about where we are, which carbon pool we're deriving our textiles from, our focus is the biosphere, that we want living, natural dyes and, and fibers to clothe human bodies. <clears throat> but that's not really the trajectory of the system we're in currently, which is focused on lithosphere-based carbon. And lithosphere-based carbon creates the plastics that you see that were typically used for outerwear that rock climbers would use, <clears throat> or some kind of outdoors or outdoor need, like maybe a farmer working in a ditch 
you need to be wearing really rain protective clothing, but we've really mainstreamed plastic clothing. So now everyone's wearing, you know, yoga pants, even if they don't do yoga or people are, you know, wearing like very high end gear, even just to go to the grocery store. And these outdoor companies too are part of this issue. They're mainstreaming the culture of outdoors to people who aren't necessarily doing that work. And it's actually promulgated a lot of use of plastic clothing. Um, so really we have access to right now, majority of what we have access to when we purchase clothing is the um, synthetics. So we're trying to game change on that at Fibershed. <laughs> and that's a problem, you know, if we're wearing lithosphere based carbon, when we throw it away <laughs> um, or incinerate it, it's like incinerating any of these plastic bottles or you know, plastic bags. It's, it's material that shouldn't be incinerated, but often um, societies don't know what else to do with all the waste. And we're throwing away 70 pounds of textile waste per American per year. Um, and then the other problem statement, just to remind ourselves, is the plastic lint that's coming off of our clothing. Um, when we wash it, <clears throat> the lion's share of plastic in the ocean today is lint. So it's material that's degrading, but not biodegrading. And these are estrogenic compounds that are getting into our food web um, because we're washing clothing and little particles are getting off of that material out into waterways and um, also into our farmlands. They're finding plastic in tap water, but it's all, you know, these microfibers are very able to get in very interesting places that are affecting human health. So the amelioration of all that, sorry to be depressing, um, is that this is a map of my fiber shed. So here's 150 miles from my, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I live right around um, the Point Reyes National Seashore and 150 miles north, east, south. Um, I don't go into the Pacific Ocean for too much um, related to my textiles but perhaps in the future we'll figure out what's going on out there. Maybe there's some seaweed dye. Um, I do use seawater as a mordant, as a binding agent, but um, for my natural dyes, that's the one way I interact with the ocean. Um, so all of these people here are either, they're natural um, fiber farmers, and that's who you see <clears throat> in the outskirts of our more urban areas. And these people grow natural dyes. They grow indigo, they're growing madder root, marigold. Um, there's a host of native plants. So we, the chaparral species like Cateromelis arbutifolia, Baccarus, Mimulus, all of these um, California native chaparral species are wonderful dyes. So these folks grow it and then the people in the urban areas metabolized it. And so for one year, I actually wore clothing whose metabolizing and growing came from all these beautiful people and all of their skills, which to the point of me constructing this prototype wardrobe, which included my socks, my underwear, my bathing suit, everything. Everything was grown, dyed, and made by these people. And to that point, none of these people knew each other. So in a way, we just formed this entire community of farmers and makers with one prototype wardrobe. And the discovery process here was not only that people actually felt this sense of meaning because they were connecting rural and urban communities through the process of growing and making, but we were creating functional garments, not just a hat or a scarf or a pair of socks, but like whole garments, pants, skirts, sweaters, things you need to survive. These people were actually intricately tied to my ability to survive. And there's nothing like creating an experience where your survival is tied to your community. When you strip down all the accoutrements of modernity and you're left with just how do I get what I need from working collaboratively, it changes your neurology. Um, it changes your empathy and your relationships deeply. Um, and this has transformed my life. So here's some of the people who I worked with. Um, this is an heirloom sheep in the back. This is a Jacob sheep. I highly recommend the primitive breeds if people are gonna be working on taking on um, grazing projects, whether they're contract grazers, youthful people moving into that space, or you have a farm and you just, you even need your grass mode and you don't wanna use fossil carbon 
to pump you know your mower out there get sheep they're amazing land managers and the primitive breeds are really hardy so this is a breed called the Jacobs uh, the ewes be, um, grow these beautiful horns and we use the horns for buttons um, and then you can see they're black and white sheep so what do you get when you mix black and white um, you actually get gray so here's um, Casey Dapp on the right. She's an Oakland designer, and she knit this, I call it the sweater shirt, with the wool from Robin Lyons Meridian Jacobs Farm. And that is a shirt that I wore all winter long. It was um, essential to my ability to survive in the winter. And um, no natural dyes is even necessary. These sheep, are, they produce such beautiful color, you don't even need a dye. So here's the Jacob sheep too in a shawl. Um, this is being worn by my friend. A lot of friends got involved and started making their own pieces. This is Alison Arnold. She raises Angora rabbits, um, but she was mixing her Angora rabbit fiber with the Jacob sheep and the shawl was woven on farm. This woman is really special. I just wanted to remind us all that a lot of the people raising um, some of these really amazing genetic I would say genetically strong flocks are a lot of women who went back to the land in the 60s and 70s and they're still raising these amazing animals that hold um, kind of the genetic heritage in our community and this is Jean Near. she's now 103 and she does Tai Chi every morning that's her claim to her um, health and vibrancy she runs Utopia Ranch, and she runs um, over 60 head of pure merino um, in a very beautiful valley. And we brought uh, the youngest designer, um, this is uh, Allison Arnold on the right, who actually knit this sweater that I wore out in the indigo fields. So people don't think you can wear wool in the summer. And I just beg to differ because um, sheep wear wool in the summer, and they do pretty well with it. Um, and I was wearing wool, this piece, the way it was knit was that there were all these air pockets. And so Allison knit it in a way where I could actually wear it out in the field and it would keep me sun protected, but it would also allow air passage. And so I actually wore this while farming um, by hand um, over an acre of indigo. And it was just a, an incredible garment. And it's made with wool from a sheep named Daisy. Um, and this, again, this is our oldest farmer working with our youngest knitter. And then I dyed the wool in Heteromeles arbutifolia, which is a native California chaparral species. And here is another inspiring um, back to the land woman inspired by Rachel Carson and um, the Peace Corps. She came back um, in her early 20s and she started breeding colored cotton, which is um, she classically breeds. She doesn't use any um, <laughs> genetic modification, which cotton right now is like 96% genetically engineered in the US. She's one of the last remaining biodynamic certified organic cotton farmers in the country. And she breeds cotton that grows beautiful colors. So these are the old varieties that go back to uh, the Moors and um, in uh, West Africa, the, the genetics are um, at least from a human perspective, we started interacting with cotton when it was a perennial. We've annualized it, um, but it, it's always grown in colors. So this is Gossypium barbadense. This is um, sea island cotton that she grows, and it's, it's a beautiful flower. I mean, just growing cotton in your garden. I think we should be re-envisioning our relationship to cotton. It's not the crazy water hog that everyone says, you know, it actually... Um, it, that she uses less water than her row crop farming vegetable neighbors. Um, and here's her cotton. So that's Gossypium barbadens um, in the full bloom. So once the cellulosic layers go onto the seed or grow onto the seed, um, you know, it goes from flower into this fluff ball. And um, this is Sierra Reading, who's a young designer that we brought into the project. Um, she's a graduate of the California College of the Arts, and now she helps Sally with her breeding program. So Sierra is, is both holding the Gisipium barbadens in the form of raw cotton in her hand. She's holding the yarn, and she's wearing her shirt 
is actually a shirt made of Gascipia barbidens. No natural dyes or synthetic dyes necessary. And her neck cowl is made with um, a merino wool that was raised that color. So here's Lania Stell, and this is a this is an amazing ranch in the um, Modoc and Lassen counties in California near the Warner Mountains uh, adjacent to the Great Basin. This ranch um, is a very large scale ranch. They, um, they are now producing um, some of the finest wool in the state of California. Uh, it's, it's a low micron count, which means you can wear it next to your skin. And behind Lonnie is her compost pile. So before we met Lonnie, she was not composting. Um, she, you know, there was some use of um, maybe more conventional ag practice on this ranch. So we started working with her on this idea of carbon drawdown, um, enhancing productivity through building soil organic carbon. And of course, when ranchers take these practices on, when they actually commit to building soil organic carbon, even if it's for, for their own productivity, we know that this has a global impact because we are removing CO2 from the atmosphere, moving it through photosynthetic activity into plants, which then store it in soil through their root systems. So there's a big impact we know that we can have, even with ranchers who may not be super sold on the idea of anthropogenic climate change, they're still really interested in the productivity related to composting, um, building carbon in soil, this ranch is so interesting. This ranch is seven and a half hours from the Bay Area, and it's night and day culturally. Um, but here is a couple of design, or here's a designer on the left who's holding, we finally actually were able to make cloth from our own wool. The first time since 1890, we built a mill out in the Sacramento Valley out um, with this amazing young man who's rebuilding old looms from the 1960s. And we took that wool that Lonnie was raising, which has now a measurable climate impact because we've done a lot of GHG modeling on her ranch. And we know she's drawing down more CO2 on her ranch than she's emitting. And so by that very net negative impact that she's having from a carbon perspective, we're able to say that her wool is climate beneficial. And this fabric that we made with her wool and this new mill produced this gorgeous draping textile that you see modeled on the right um, by one of the models that um, that we worked with for our last fashion show. So we had a climate beneficial fashion gala to celebrate this fusion of urban and rural and land restoration, climate amelioration, and actually beauty, just straight up making beautiful things for people to wear. So here's the fashion show. That dye you see there on that color orange Wool does not grow orange, um, but that is Coreopsis tinctorium, which is a beautiful flower that you can deadhead, dry the flowers, and then use to make bright orange. Um, so that's, that's a really nice piece. And there's some of the example up close of matter root, red on the left, um, Coreopsis orange on the right. Oh, and this is just a reminder that as we develop these communities of amazing, beautiful design. Um, you know, we have fashion shows around this design practice. We make sure that people are aware of where everything comes from, which is the pedosphere. We are a pedosphere based system. We, we focus on soil, soil health, and we talk to people about the importance of acknowledging which carbon pool your clothing comes from. We also make sure people understand that this is really about managing carbon cycling and increasing photosynthetic capture on all the ranches and farms we work with. So we actually go out on farms and ranches that were part of this fashion show. and We've tested all of their soil for soil organic carbon, mineralizable nitrogen, soil organic matter, and we've set goals. We actually want to increase soil organic matter by 1% in the next two years on all these ranches and farms. Um, we want to draw down over a million metric tons of carbon. We have very um, strategic scientific goals, but we try to make that palatable to a mainstream audience. So here's just some really hand-painted signs we have at our fashion shows. 
and some of the brands we're working with. Um, we just start, launched this project. It took a long time, I will admit, two years um, to get this off the ground. Um, but it is a beanie, and you can order it today. <laughs> it just came out. Um, it was so exciting to see a big brand like the North Face, which is actually owned by the largest textile corp in the world, uh, VF Corp. This brand is now working with Bear Ranch with Lonnie Estelle, who was pictured earlier, and they're making climate beneficial wool beanies. And we were just pleased as ever to see this project um, because it really could mean that perhaps we could make a dent in the mainstream practices of how commodity agriculture works and really transforming large scale commodity ag to meet the needs of these brands, but changing the value structure changing how we value wool, putting a new price on wool that's climate beneficial, helping manage landscapes to restore carbon. We know we've lost at least 40% of the carbon in California's soils because of the annualization of the systems, the grassland systems. So we have a lot of work to do and we actually need to scale this work quickly. And so we actually do need partnerships. I would call them unlikely partnerships for myself because um, I am more of an artisan and a small scale producer, but I'm totally um, aware of the fact of what we have to do and how quickly we have to do it and who we need to bring on the team to get it done. So um, this is this is Bodega Bay. I just wanted to iterate some of the the, the wool that we grow that is um, is a little rougher. So these are churro and Romney cross sheep. And what do we do with wool that we can't wear? Um, so here's Hazel, one of the shepherdesses up in this bodega pastures, um, which is our coastal climate, not high and dry, but very coastal and moist and cool. And we are making these. This is Carol Frechette. She's a designer. And you can see a felted hat. So with some of the rougher wools, if you line that hat with a little bit of Sally Fox's cotton, you can make these amazing hats and we we're also making bedding, we're making pillows and we're making duvet covers. So with about 3.1 million pounds of wool in California, 900,000 pounds is wearable. Like you could wear it next to your skin. But the remainder is really going to be used for felt, bedding and durable goods. So here's a, just a reiteration of all those beautiful images of women and men on the land. I guess in this case, mainly women. I'm finding mainly women take on these uh, fiber systems roles in this country. Um, it's not like that in every culture, but our culture seems to be a bit female dominated in this space. Um, doesn't really matter to me. I just think it's interesting to see that in agriculture, um, how we see women leading on these sheep projects. Um, but anyway, here is the soil to soil system. And we are definitely focusing a lot on the rangeland, farmland, carbon sinks in this work, but we also take on the milling. Um, we really do need value added infrastructure near the farms and ranches where these materials are grown. We need mills. Um, we have a historic precedent for mills in California. We once had 12. We have now we've rebuilt one. <laughs> um, we're getting another one soon. Um, but we can see how all of these systems, when you regionalize them, you, ad you advance connectivity between urban and rural communities, you create meaningful livelihood. Um, so just to iterate what we bring to the table for farms and ranches and designers, we, these kind of infographics where we're trying to share with people, look, um, this grass that the sheep is eating, it's, you know, 40% of this is carbon um, that once came, oops, Sorry, from the landscape. So um, how can we think about sheep and um, carbon cycling and clothing? And so this, this is an example of the kind of education we're trying to, to share with folks. Um, so let's see, I'm looking at the time. Okay, so I'm going to, um, that is the last slide I have in this particular sequence. Um, and so I wanted to, I, I do want to go over the carbon farming piece a little bit more. Neil had, um, want, I think you would ask me to, to touch on that more. Um, but I don't have a slide for that. So 
I think what I'm going to do, we have about half an hour left. Um, maybe I could go to questions, um, if that's possible. Sure, we can open it up. Let's do it. That was, that was great. I mean, you're, you're fast. You're both fast and really concise and equally inspiring. So that that's 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 great how how just concise you are with your message. Uh, so we are opening up to questions, everybody. So if you have one, just type in that chat box below what you would like to ask Rebecca. You know, I've got one or two myself. Go for it, Raleigh. Uh, okay. I want to ask how you get multiple stakeholders signed on to this. Like, what's the incentive? For someone who, you know, from the the sheep, you know, the sheep rancher to the guy in the city, basically all these stakeholders, like why are they all signed on to this? Mm, that's a great question. Well, it the initial one year wardrobe challenge was initiated with a Kickstarter campaign, so I had around ten thousand dollars to spend on photography, um, videography, and the actual wool and the artisanship. And so um, what I was able to say is, look, if you'd like to take part in this, I'm going to buy your wool for full price. Um, it's going to help me make a sweater that, you know, I'm going to tell a story with, and we're going to professionally photograph your farm. And we're going to, I'm going to write, I'm a writer. I have written a book on natural dyeing. So there was some precedent that people understood that I could amplify their farm story through the written word. And mm -hmm. I went to their farm and I interviewed them extensively. So not only was I buying their wool, but I was interviewing them about their life, their journey, their practice, their dreams, their vision. And I brought a, a, a good friend who took the photo you're seeing here, um, Paige Green, came with me to these farms. and then I would bring, I'd drive to the farm again, and I would bring one of the designers. And I went to the design schools. So a lot of the initial motivation from the designers was that, you know, Sierra Reading, when I first met her in this image, she was trying to fulfill some of her goals for her graduate thesis. So she was making materials um, for her projects at school, and, and I was paying her a stipend. And so what I did was I tried to amplify, like, what do people want here? Like, okay, you're trying to finish a master's thesis. Okay, you're, you want to get more business for your farm or ranch, and I'm a writer, and I'm bringing a photographer, and we're basically marketing for you for free, and I'm also paying everyone to do this. So everyone got used to, and from the very beginning, that we weren't in this to exploit. We were in this to build mutually beneficial relationships at every turn and value one another's work. So we don't expect off the bat when we're building these relationships for people to just do everything for free or, you know, we, we of course there's volunteer hours that go into all this, but that's not exactly how I initiated my relationships. I initiated them with, complete and utter respect for whatever, wherever these people were at, and I met them where they were. And I think that's the key to all the stakeholders. And it's not easy, and I totally, I obviously have many screw-ups where I'm not meeting people where they are. It, it happens. But what I try to do, even with the brands, it's like, well, what do you need? What do you need to tell a compelling story about your carbon footprint as a company? could you think about not offsetting with conservation projects in other countries to offset your carbon of your supply chain? What if your supply chain itself was the offset? What if regeneration meant every part of your supply chain is making a positive impact? Because we know conservation and offsets have an end game. If industrial capitalism continues to grow, which is completely dependent on a growth model, unabated, <laughs> you'll eventually have these rubs between conservation and industrial capitalism, which is like the story of our time. So what do we need to do within the industrial models so they are not continually butting up against intact ecosystems? Or even right now, most ecosystems are, are dying. 
So I, to the brand, I'm positing a new paradigm, which is regenerate the system from soil to soil that you are dependent on for your supply chain. Um, and so that, that's a, that was a game changer in 2013. And I think that there, there was like this aha moment of like, oh yeah, business as usual is so not gonna work for very long like this. So what if we do make our supply chain regenerative? And what will that mean? So again, you're just, you're trying to hit the target of like, what do people need that's gonna move them forward on their critical path? And then how do you identify where two critical paths could line up? And um, it's done through, yeah, carrots. I don't use sticks. I definitely use carrots. That's great. Yeah, that's really great hearing how you approach so many people that are coming from so many different backgrounds. That's that's a huge piece that I always love hearing about. And, and Neil's had to deal with a lot in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it sounds very familiar, to be honest, where there's a lot of, you have to have some sort of built-in social capital before you get your foot in the door, right? People have to have a, a reason to trust you and to pay attention to you just, just to get started. And for you, that was your book. Um, and then after that, it's figuring out how, how do we appeal to everybody's self-interest with the same system? Um, because that's, that's what motivates people. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, really interesting to hear what, are, for me, are some familiar parallels. Uh, mm. I had a question, but look, we've got a bunch tap, typed up here. Wendy Buyens says, this is a fabulous presentation, Rebecca, but where can I start? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We need some more information from you, Wendy, before we can say where to start. A little bit more info. I, I got a good question from, um, oh, sorry. Okay, if you can answer that, Rebecca, go ahead. Oh, just, I'd love to hear from Wendy if she has, is approaching this from a producer standpoint or a consumer standpoint or both. Um, yeah, okay. That would be my question to her. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so here's, a, here's one I saw from Michael. It was a, just, a, I think, a good little follow-up to the question I just asked. He's asked, like, will the stakeholders that sign up for wool also be willing to sign up for to sell meat as well? Um, you mean in terms of a climate beneficial a, a thought process around meat production? Is that the question? Or will they be the brands themselves um, that we work with obviously are textile focused? Um, but we have not necessarily felt like the grass fed and finished meat space needs, like there are quite a few people working on both infrastructure development for that. There's some philanthropists in our community called The Herd um, who are focused on grass fed finished infrastructure. So the way we work with fiber system infrastructure, feasibility studies and analysis, they're working on the meat side and we collaborate with them. In terms of um, end users and getting meat to the market, um, there's, there are, there are for-profit businesses working on that in our community. So we don't necessarily, um, we complement, I would say, one another. Um, fiber systems are the underdog, though, in the protein market. Yeah. So they're protein fibers, but protein ingestibles, protein meat, is what has been receiving most of the philanthropic and investment support. Um, some of the largest um, Silicon Valley folk um, who now own ranches <clears throat> in California have taken to grass-fed and finished beef, <clears throat> and I think lamb to a degree. So we, we see that there's like already a lot of, I think, momentum in that space. I know not enough, and I know we always need more markets and more direct markets, but um, wool is so undervalued that people were barely able to pay for the shearing costs. In fact, most ranchers were going, like wool itself was a debt, um, and even people were trying to change the genetics. They were going to raise sheep that didn't even need to be sheared because, and some people are still doing that because they just, they can't even afford to raise 
a wool sheep. So we're, we're working on saving pretty much what was a dying system. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to expand if, if I'm, I'm not addressing it. Rebecca, do you have a comment on, like there's so much focus on locality and, and natural context, but there's a, a lot of people getting on a, a hemp bandwagon right now with respect to textiles. Um, and I've often thought that we should be growing our, we should be replacing most cotton with hemp production because of its initial advantages, ec both economically and ecologically. But do you have any kind of comment on that? I'm, I'm wondering if my impression is accurate or not. Oh, hemp is is um, a wonderful uh, fiber crop. We're, we are working with uh, hemp producer in South Central Colorado. And we've been working with him since 2014 and we are working in Eastern Kentucky and we've been working there since 2014 when the laws changed. Mm. California, we're still working on a regulatory framework for hemp, um, but we are testing, we've been testing the processing systems. So hemp is, um, you know, it's a very sturdy material, has a lot of lignin and pectin. So yes, while I do see the potential for hemp coming into the natural fiber system in a pretty massive way, and I look forward to that day, we do have technological answers that we need to come up with or solutions to problems around ecological pectin and lignin removal. So when you see hemp in a field and you stand there and you're amongst that plant, Mm -hmm. It's very different than standing like in a cotton field where you just you pull the cotton off the, you know the bowl off of the stem and the cotton feels in your hand like your t-shirt. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a field of hemp and you touch a hemp stalk, it does not feel like your t-shirt. So there's any time nature creates a material um, and it doesn't feel like the end product that us consumers are used to, you got to know there's a big technology gap that you have to fill between the texture that you feel in the field and the texture of your t-shirt. So we've been building a technology bridge between the field and the wearer. And we've been working with um, a company called Bastcore. And we have a wool symposium that we're live streaming on November 11th. And Bastcore engineers will be there because we really see this value in blending right now hemp with other fibers um, because the hemp right now is a little rough. We have a lot of softening work we have to do. We have to do that ecologically. So, um, but yes, to your point, if we can bridge these technology pieces, um, which I know I have full faith we can, there's no reason. I mean, the Chinese are doing it beautifully. They have different labor <laughs> practices, obviously. So, we have to, you know, make it work for us culturally, but the Chinese have been working with hemp for 5,000 years or more, and they, they know what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. We can too. So um, I, I just, I see it as a great, great solution, but I just don't want to get people thinking like it's an immediate solution. We just have some work to do and some capital investments in the processing. Got it. What's the name of the, no of the seminar you're doing on November 11th? Uh, it's called the Wool and Fine Fiber Symposium, and um, it's on our on our website. It'll be live streamed for folks who are not in the area, but it, it will be in Point Reyes Station. Cool. Uh, this is really I. When we talk about climate beneficial wool, is this generally that they are managing the grazing kind of Alan Savory? style like it's holistically managed grazing and that's where our, the basis for the claim comes from that it's uh, climate beneficial or is yeah what's that based on that's a great question so um, <clears throat> we've taken an approach to the whole farm system that does include a grazing management plan that does reflect adaptive managed grazing, which is basically holistic management, which is basically what Savory came up with. 
Um, we don't call it rotational, though. We call it adaptive managed because we, as probably many people listening to this know, you can rotate animals through a system and still ruin that system <laughs> if you're not paying attention to right. rainfall and all that. So we, we try to... Um, acknowledge that oftentimes the the rancher has really good reasons for doing what they're doing or they maybe they just inherited an idea of how to do things so it's a space that's sensitive that we approach um, generally with someone who's a certified um, rangeland manager so in California you have to have some to do a grazing management plan you have to have some some education and certification behind you. So we've brought on different people to help us with these grazing management plans specific to a chapter. This is just like the grazing management is one chapter in a whole carbon farm plan. So you can go on our website and download the plans, but they include many more practices. Um, Repairing corridor restoration is huge. Putting yep. vegetation back in those creeks and getting the hydrology functioning again is a massive drawdown strategy for carbon. Um, silvo pasture, putting oaks, um, in particularly in our community, um, mm-hmm. a lot of oaks and or other species that are producing material that, you know, fruit or nut species uh, back in the pastures for shade for the animals and more productivity um, for the land and What's so silvo? Oh, hedgerows. Hedgerows are also a game changer from a carbon perspective. And our country has definitely not used hedgerows as much as I'd like to see because I think we got this idea where we were going to plow fence post to fence post. Uh Um, And so we just never really articulated the potential of hedgerows. And so putting those in the system. And then there's 35 other practices that we use. Um, to model. And we use um, Colorado State University team, Keith Postian's team, their Nobel Prize winning um, biogeochemical soil focused computer modeling team. So we can take GPS coordinates and um, we can say we're going to put a hedgerow in here. And their system, which is called Comet, will help us. It's, it's a very in refinement system, but it's got a lot of academic and on the ground backbone, it'll spit out a number for us and it'll say, yes, we could sequester 40 metric tons of carbon with this many linear feet of hedgerow on these GPS coordinates. And this is what it looks like in five years and then in 10 years and 20 years. That's pretty amazing. So they're the ones measuring all of that for you or, or rather they're taking you're saying we're putting a hedgerow in here and it's this wide and this long and they can say based on other stuff we've looked at this is what it's going to do right correct and they've been using they have a hundred years of soil sampling or something like back to North America's original soil sampling collection they've they've been soil sampling a meter deep in regions across the US for so many decades that I um, there, you know, there's their science is backed by actual soil sampling. And yes, we can use the tool ourselves. Like you and I could use the tool. It's called Comet Planner. Comet Planner? Mm-hmm. It's and online. It's the University of Colorado. Yeah, the USDA actually put their stamp on it. Um, so it might even show up as a as a USDA tool, but it's Comet Planner and Colorado State University is the team doing that work. And they're internationally renowned team. They're working now in Jordan and uh, Brazil and India on getting, um, because the UN is really interested in seeing what we can do globally on drawdown through soils. And so you need these, these soil inventories. So the UN's helping people in different countries get the data they need to create an inventory of the soil. And then it's Keith and team who are going in and saying, Let's model. Now we can model practices based on this understanding of your baseline. Yeah, we need them in Saudi Arabia. You should connect. I bet Saudi Arabia has the money to pay them to be there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in Saudi Arabia. 
But uh, there we are. Thanks for bringing that up, Raleigh. Comet-planner.com. Those are the folks doing the modeling and the and the measuring. Yeah, and Matthew, really cool. Matthew Sterner is um, someone you can connect with. They do trainings. I'm forgetting is it every Tuesday and Thursday. You can go and work with the team and learn how to use the tool. Hmm. Cool stuff. Yeah, uh, here's, here's another good question. I think from Monica. Uh, it relates. And Kate, this might answer your question too. So Monica is asking, are you aware of any other fiber shed like collaborations in North America? And how are you able to quantify the carbon they capture in the soil? I think she just answered that. Yeah, but yeah any other fiber shed like collaborations in North America? Yes, we have on our website, if you can go to fibershed.org, I think it's under the community heading, we have um, an affiliate program so we have 34 national community organizers and I think a total of 50 community organizers fiber shed community organizers internationally so we have fiber sheds in the Pacific Northwest focused on flax production there's um, in the I'm just trying to think of another fiber shed that's got kind of a really bioregionally interesting signature um, in Minnesota they're working on both hemp and wool blending um, in California we actually have an LA fiber shed we have a San Diego fiber shed we have um, Feather River fiber shed we actually have four fiber sheds in California <laughs> so people are, are organizing um, bioregionally so what right. makes sense for my geography? I'm going to start thinking about my geography from a fiber lens. That's fantastic stuff. Um, I had a question and it just slipped my mind. But uh, what's, um, what's a way that people can support you in your work, Rebecca, for the people who are here? I think that you could, well, there's three ways. <clears throat> it's really supporting the movement, which is I'm, I'm really hopeful that people will start looking at the carbon pool where their clothing comes from. I, I'd really love it if people thought about buying 100% natural fiber clothing when they need to purchase clothing at all. Um, I also really inspire, I'm inspired and would hope people would take on the culture of mending and nurturing their clothes so they last longer. So <clears throat> getting your clothing um, repaired and working with people to keep your clothing in play, doing clothing swaps versus taking your clothes to the Goodwill or the Salvation Army where a lot of that clothing ends up overseas or incinerated. Um, I feel like... Um, if you don't have a lot of money, which it's if you're homesteading and you're not using the money economy as much, just like again, mending and tending your clothing, swapping it with your friends and neighbors. And then when you do buy clothing, please buy 100% natural fiber so that at the end of life you can compost that clothing because clothing is a wonderful carbon material for a nitrogen rich compost pile. So <clears throat> food waste and clothing are wonderful nitrogen carbon combos and um, I really would love to see more people just bringing that kind of attention to it and then really the last piece I'll say about this is be a very awake to what is coming down the pipeline around fiber systems you see it in food systems multinationals are going to try to tell you that they have the next green solution to clothe you mm -hmm. And I really want people to understand how important it is that we keep genetic integrity on this planet. And genetic integrity to me means open source genetics. Any of you could raise Robin Lyons Jacob sheep or Jean Mears Merino sheep. None of you could raise a genetically engineered microbe fed by sugar that creates a biofilm that's going to create the next silk because those microbes and yeast that have been genetically engineered to make modern day eco silk those are patented technologies and the capital and the benefits to creating those systems reside in a f the hands of a few and so we saw this with Monsanto and genetically engineered cotton 
we are headed towards a whole GMO 2.0 culture if we don't wake up to what's happening with synthetic biology. And it's hitting our food and fiber system um, faster than it'll make your head spin in the next few years what's happening. So I just hope we stay committed to our farms, our ranches, our land-based economies, and don't let anyone sell you a bill of goods on what you're wearing. Like really make sure you have a transparent supply chain and you know the full life cycle of that garment and that it can go back into your soil and there's no toxic stuff on that, <laughs> just on that material, which is another topic. But I just say keep awake and stay and ask a lot of questions. That's what I would say would help this movement. <laughs> Fantastic. That is smart. Very smart. All right. Well, I think we, you've got about four minutes left, so I think we're going to close it up here. But, um, Rebecca, we love the work you're doing. We support it wholeheartedly. I think it's really important uh, and often overlooked. And uh, we're so thankful we could have you on, and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Uh, I think you and I have some things to talk about. We, I think we both have some connections that would be mutually beneficial to one another. Uh, but we'll get that. We'll get to that after. Um, to all of you folks who are with us live today, thank you so much. Um, we love when you come to our webinars and that you get to ask really great questions and uh, interact with po folks who are doing uh, really important work. So thank you very much. And uh, Raleigh, have you got anything before we close it out? That's about it. I'm just stoked. I really want to buy some California wool. Like I, I make sure I always buy hemp when I can. Good. This is this was made in California. Like that's uh, it was like you know, sometimes you buy a shirt, it's 150, but it's worth it because it lasts longer. Yes. You know, price it, per wear. It's totally worth it. So I'm, I want to buy that wool hat because I'm gonna do some Yosemite hiking in the snow. Thank you. Yes, buy the California wool beanie so we can move money back to that ranch and keep planting trees in the pasture. Thanks, Dre. And so your site has info about a lot of these ranches that people can buy from and visit. Yeah, like that. you can go onto the community tab, um, and if there's a, a producer directory, and if you scroll down, um, oh, it's yeah, the directory itself. There's a map. You can look for climate beneficial. Um, but if you go scroll down uh, farther, yeah. there's a Brady – I call it the Brady Bunch photos. Wow, and, that is so cool. Yeah, you can buy textiles straight from the farm. Woo. That – you guys put together a pretty kick-ass website. That's, that's really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. All right, folks, next week we've got Eric Olson back on. Uh, he's going to talk about managing fire in wake of the fires in California. And then we have who, – who's after Eric? Uh, then Brad Lancaster. Brad Lancaster <laughs> coming on the end of the month to talk about watershed uh, – rainwater harvesting and watershed management. So yeah. hope to see you folks in the next couple weeks. And for the meantime, have a really good one. Thanks, everybody. And, yeah, for more webinars like this, visit SustainableDesignMasterclass.com. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate your time. And now we're officially going to end it, and we're stopping recording.